Hello everybody and welcome, I'm Strategic Primus, and this is a Game of Thrones for CK2. I'm going to be walking through what all this mod actually does, and what better way to test out the mod than by looking at Aegon the Conqueror, as he has a lot of the uh, more unique things. Now the first thing I would like to note is this is a full conversion mod, and it completely converts the entirety of the world of Westeros all the way through. You have Sotheros, you have Essos, you have Westeros, you have the Summer Isles, you have the Blight that is Valyria, it all looks very good, it's mostly stable. Uh, you will occur some problems with bouncing around in the Far East. Um, I've noticed occasional problems with messing around with the Basilis Islands and Sotheros. It's very stable. In Westeros, as you get further east it gets a little bit less stable. By the time you hit a Shy, things are weird. But the guys are working on it. It is not exactly multiplayer friendly, however the mod is very thorough. As you'll see here in the game rules, it adds a couple of different bits here. Uh, it will give you a version warning. Uh, I disable this because it's obnoxious uh, when you're actually out of sync like I am at the moment, but it still works fine. Uh, it will allow you to remove spoilers if you're not catched up. Catched up, caught up, that's the way to say that. Uh, it will also tell you whether or not you want R plus L equals J on. If you don't know what it means, you don't want it on. And the usual stuff in here until you get all the way down to... Ah, it also adds the Mega War system, which is when you have an Empire tier title with a bunch of people underneath it, like Aegon here will make eventually, uh, the Lord sworn to you will all break off and go helter-skelter. Um, like in the books, they'll have the choices to whether or not they want to be loyal, strike on their own, join the rebellion, or just stay neutral and buy their time. <laughs> phrase. Uh, you can turn on and off White Walkers. There are non lore invasions. I'm leaving them on. Uh, which is things like the Burlman, Mountain Clansmen, Summer Islanders, all sorts of things that have been alluded to in the books but have not actually occurred. You also then have dragon hatching and taming. There are dragons in this, obviously. And you can ch manually change how difficult it is to deal with them. This will dramatically change your playthrough if you're actually playing through a start date with dragons in it. Um, there's also the High Valyrian Call, which basically makes it almost impossible for anyone to become High Valyrian that isn't High Valyrian. Uh, you can change the outcome randomness of duels. I like setting it to low for obvious reasons. I don't like being killed with a kitchen knife. Uh, Battlefield do Occurrence, I always set it to more frequent because they're hilarious to watch. Uh, Nomad Invasions, I let that happen. Hi High Lordship Creation, this all means you have to have a title in the High Lordship to create it. Uh, you can allow for disinheritance and abdications. They also have colonization uh, for those bits that are not quite settled at the moment, so like Old Stones. <clears throat> and then later start to raise Summer Hall. Sorry, clearing my throat. And you also see the usual uh, Shattered Realms of Symmetrical Start. And then we get into the Expanded Realm Ambition. So if you have a very ambitious leader, you will have decisions that you can let your lords... Uh, you can bring up to your lords a petition to allow you to go and invade somewhere else. Uh, you have to be ambitious or ruthless or greedy, and basically it's a hey, I'm an empire tier guy and I have no de jure on you, but you know I'm a good, I'm I'm a warlike king. I'm gonna go over there and take it. Uh, they've completely worked worked the female era JI. They actually will not make poor decisions these days, um, and they will cancel if a decision becomes poor if unless the marriage has actually occurred. Uh, traditional dynastic claims basically means that the Targaryens, Tyrells, everybody who's big and important in Westeros and a couple of other places will always have their claims on their ancestral seats, meaning that they will be continuously engaged in the conflicts uh, as they gain or lose land. As long as the house is still alive, they will attempt to claim their seats back. And there's dynastic stability, which basically means that if you're going to war with a title and you have a claim on it through their dynasty, you can become their dynasty. It's silly, but I understand why they made it. Uh, I always love advocating claims because it's very notable. And there's dynamic coat of arms in this. Uh, basically, I'll show you what that does by starting this game right here. Let it load up. Come on, come on. 
The reason why I'm showing you with Aegon is he also has a couple of the other features that this mod adds, like your Valyrian Steel Sword. Uh, he, of course, has Blackfire, which will only in this give you a uh, plus 0.25% monthly prestige, which is pretty good. However, it may also give you a certain amount of dual skill. Uh, it doesn't say that it does, but I've noticed that uh, characters with Valyrian Steel Swords tend to do slightly better in duels than those who don't. Uh, he has Formidable Fighter, so this mod adds uh, fighter variation traits. There's Formidable, Skilled, Trained, and then... Uh, what's the lowest one again? Trained... Poor. That's it. Uh, for fighter tiers, it's up to four, which is Formidable. Um... And of course, it also adds dragons, which need to come in at the moment. It does not start with load, so I'm just going to do the things I reflexively do when playing as Aegon. Ah, yes. I am Blood of Old Valyria. That message there basically said, hey, you're a Targaryen. You get a whole bunch of nice things. And this little modifier right here, which basically means you get less national revolt. Because the small folk think you're almost a god which makes sense for early Targaryens. And here you'll see dragons. Now, for those of you who are more experienced with uh, CK2, this looks like a very silly character, as you have no diplomacy, no uh, stewardship, no intrigue, no learning, and a crap lot Marshall. Uh, this is because dragons immediately get minus 50 to all their stats but Marshall, as only Marshall will really count for a dragon. And that is their ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another dragon. Uh, Basically, this value is uh, dragon on dra sorry, not dragon on dragon combat. This is dragon on dragon combat, which is their dual skill estimate. That's actually having a dragon duel, and the martial value is how much damage you will do as a dragon deployed against men or as a marshal or commander. Uh, they're not actually made a commander. You're underneath the commander who is the rider who gets a significant bonus for being a dragon rider, plus 10 martial is no small thing. It can make anyone who's pretty bad at this pretty good at this very quickly. And dragons have their own traits that do different things. Uh, there's things that edit taming chances, there's things that modify dual skill estimates, and there's things that modify size growth, which is the expansion of that martial skill. <clears throat> Dragons will continue to grow until they die, such that a very old dragon will have a, a more normally will have a higher martial than a younger dragon. For example, we have Balerion the Black Tread here, one of the biggest, nastiest dragons to ever live, and he's at 107 martial at 113 years of age. We go over here to my uh, sister wives dragons, and Vagar here is at 48 martial for, for only being 49. And he has different traits here as well, as you'll see not quite as uh, amazing in Dragon, but still very terrifying when he gets deployed. Raxes. All that. Now, as you'll see in this start date, the Iron Throne doesn't actually exist yet. I am Aegon Targaryen trying to go make it. It's quite an interesting one to do. There's, of course, the wall, which works like a democracy. It's it's very entertaining, and it you can send people to the wall, and the people you send to the wall will actually participate in the, the dynamics of the wall. Now, as for actually uh, doing gameplay in this mod, uh, army sizes tend to be a bit inflated. I am only a high lord, and I can call upon 3,000 men, ignoring the fact that I have dragons. King Heron the Black here, who is a double king, can call upon 29,000. For proportion's sake, the Reach at the moment can call upon 22.9,000. And the Lannisters can call upon 29,000. Aaron's only 14. Baratheon's 23. And Dorne 24. Lest we forget the Starks, 21,000. Most of the reason why the why the veil is so much lower is because they have a seven year old boy on the throne with a regent who is not all that good at martial. Makes sense, really, if you think about it. Now, these numbers will change and vary quite a bit. I have noticed through play that if you get a 
king or a high lord of the reach who has a very high marshal, their levy expands ridiculously. Meaning that if you have a good marshal in the reach, you will have a very large army. And be very hard to deal with, especially if your vassals actually like you. If your vassals don't like you, you have your own problems, but that's vassal politics. <clears throat> They also add in the wildlings, which are these groups of uh, lords and chiefs and things up here, who have very, very few men and very weak holdings. And on their death, their secessions uh, get split up and are very hard to actually keep them all together. But they can hire in mercenaries for very, very cheap, oftentimes off of either prestige, faith, or small amounts of money. And these uh, bits of men that you can add onto your force actually begin to add up pretty quickly once you start eating up these other tiny little chieftains and things to start making a bigger, better wildling, such that you can very easily become a king beyond the wall, given the right sort of situations and being the right kind of a chieftain, and truly combat the Night's Watch. You will most often be fighting through very small amounts of men until you actually become the king beyond the wall, where you're going to have to deal with somewhere around three to 6,000 Night's Watchmen. I've seen numbers that are higher and numbers that are significantly lower. It varies quite a bit. Depends on the Lord or Commander and how much support the Night Watch actually receives from the realm. Moving on to the east, we see a whole bunch of republics out here, which play out as republics often do, with Bravos, Lorath, Pentos, Mir, Tyrosh, Lys, and Volantis as all republics. Not to mention that Colhera is a republic as well, I do believe. Yep, republic as well. And Norvos is a theocracy, so you cannot play as Norvos, which is a little bit of a pain, but, but you know, details. Slavery's Bay, obviously these are all republics. Has done, as I recall, however, is a kingdom. And this is with a whole bunch of Dothraki. Dothraki play rather weirdly. I do not have horse lords, so they play via how the mod makes them play versus how horse lords would make them play. Uh, I have not spent too much time as Dothraki, but from what I understand, they can only war with each other via the current settings until they become a great call, at which place the great call, call can go do whatever the heck he wants to in Essos with a whole bundle of men, and is quite frankly something that the entirety of the rest of the continent should try to prevent from happening. E.T. works as a very large, very dysfunctional empire, a lot like Westeros, where the top guy has 73,000 men to call upon if he can, and the numbers out here really do begin to get absolutely crazy. 19,000 here, a very small one, 16, 20. Uh, this isn't quite the crazy numbers that I'm expecting. Apparently this start date has them a little bit less heavily populated, but 23 right here, and he's not even the top guy. That's pretty nuts for an, for a moderately small empire. This is not as big as Westeros. Westeros has a lot of space in comparison. It's very densely populated, very large amounts of men. And a shy tends to be a little bit buggy, but I'm going to attempt here anyway. Uh, lots of them wear these masks because they're shadow binders, and we'll get into that later. Uh, but basically, it adds all the religions. It... Uh, this mod adds all the religions to the game, and Shadowbinders is religion in this. Um, and out here, things get a little bit weird with mysticism and voodoo and all the silly lore things that Martin likes to put at the edge of his world. Now, my thoughts on the game it, uh, on this mod are that it runs extraordinarily well in a high amount of focus. However, it is utterly impossible to play multiplayer on this because it will crash every couple of months if you're... Uh, playing on a bad connection, or if uh, you're not on the exact same version. If you're the, not on the exact same version, it's hopeless. Now, um, have I had multiplayer experiences on this work pretty well? Yeah, but they were difficult to set up and, and were, I'd argue, more trouble than they were worth. Now, uh, the gameplay on this is very in-depth and very good. Uh, they had a whole bunch of different traits to have. They... Uh, the, the various different th ways of interacting with people are expanded by quite a bit. There are Kingsguard, Blood Feuds, all that good stuff. Uh, Valyrians can choose Syndicate Faiths and a whole bunch of things. There's a slave trade in existence if you're the right kind of uh, ruler. Uh, you, you can t 
fully interact with the uh, Iron Bank. You can legitimize your bastards or other people's bastards or you know, all that sort of thing. You can buy Unsullied. Uh, there's a whole tab for managing dragons. Uh, there are blood feuds, which, yes, can happen to you and against you. Uh, you can create them uh, if you start whacking off a family too hard. Uh, I've, I've had one or two be created. You have to really try at it, though. Uh, and it can happen to you, as in somebody... Uh, some of the AI can sometimes uh, mess you up enough that they go after you. Now, as for people actually using the treasury, there are crowns in this game. This is the crown of winter. It's, it's the Stark's old school crown, back when they were kings. This is the one they gave up to the Targaryens when they came north. It does what it says on the screen. Quite frankly, uh, I kind of wish they... they uh, updated the Valyrian Steel Swords to work with the treasury, because I think that would be a bit cooler than how it is at the moment. However, I completely understand that they've been working on this mod since long before the treasury was even a concept in uh, Paradox's mindset. And I am alright with how it works. It's not the smoothest thing in the world to have it like this, uh, but it will always be inherit inherited to the right people, depending on the rules of the sword, and most of them will run just fine. There's also a whole tab for keeping track of them right here, the shoulder is Valyrian Blades. Here they are. And it will even explain to you the rules of sword inheritance. Uh, it usually goes to the current heir of the same dynasty. If the, your heir is not of the same dynasty, it will go to a child of the same dynasty, sibling then to a member, uh, then it will go to the current era, then any child, then your spouse, then your liege, then any vassal. Except for Dawn, which has its own rules of House Dane, which is entirely historically correct, and a Targaryen or, or a Corbray uh, will usually pass Dark Sister or Lady Forlorn, uh, Dark Sister for Targaryens, Forlorn for Corbray, respectively to the head of the house upon their death, and it will then be granted out from there. So, for example, should my sister Senya end up dying, I will then have the choice to bestow a Dark Sister on whoever I want to. And if they're still a Targaryen or a Targaryen bastard, they will usually get it back. Now, as for uh, tactics in this game, dragons are immensely powerful. You have three of them, and you can do a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of damage. So if you're Danny and you've acquired uh, two dragon riders to go with you, or if you're Aegon, you can pretty much do whatever you jolly well want to. Because with these 3,000 men, you're probably thinking, oh, you can't take all Westeros with that. I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah, I can. Easy. Let the decision come up. Unless I didn't actually click the right thing at the beginning. There's usually... All man manners of uh, quest-like things and quest-like decision branches for Targaryens and other people if they're part of the uh, start date. I think I clicked the just wrong start date to do that. I'm just before that all occurs such that, yes, I, I am just before all that occurs because this is, yes, okay. Um... So this is the one without all that, because I was just sitting here to explain the mechanics to you without actually uh, playing the game. I hope you liked this video. I hope I've explained at least something about it. And, uh, yeah, this is a Game of Thrones mod for Crusader Kings 2. I will put the link to how to get the mod in the description below. Have a good day.